All right. We're ready to kick off. So welcome to our fifth episode of Valence Developer Diaries. And today we're going to do it in two parts. The first is going to be Valence um, two-factor authentication. And then the second, we're going to dive into the Nitro App Builder grid widget. And today we have Richard Malone, who's going to go over the new two-factor authentication. So I'm just going to hand it off to you, Richard. Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks for inviting me as a guest speaker today, Johnny. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm going to um, turn my video off and then share my screen. And we'll just take a moment here. And are you seeing this uh, presentation I have up, Johnny? We do. Okay. All right. So I just want to go through a couple slides here so we can understand what we're going to do. And I'll, I'll demonstrate the two-factor authentication and how to set it up. But uh, first, let's just talk a little bit about it here. So Valence uses a two-factor authentication type called TOTP or T-O-T-P. And that's basically, you know, a time-based one-time password. And it requires the user to have a smartphone. So the user would install this uh, TOTP compatible app on their phone and there's, there's many different apps that they could use. We use Google Authenticator at CNX, but you could also use Microsoft Authenticator, there's Authy, um, and there's a bunch of others too, but these are sort of the most common ones. <clears throat> so what the user will do is they'll go through an activation process for the two-factor authentication with Valence and their smartphone. And then once they do that, this six digit numeric passcode will change every 30 seconds within this app. Uh, all right, so that's sort of how it works. And I was suggesting that, you know, if you want to learn more about TOTP authentication, you can just sort of go to Wikipedia and just learn more about how that works. Um, so here's what we're, we're going to do to set it up. How do you configure it if you want to use it within Valence? Well, first of all, <clears throat> you've got to review your uh, date and time settings and work system values because this the way this authentication works is all based on time. So the time uh, between uh, the time setting on your phone and the time on the IBM I server has to be really close, has to be identical. So we're gonna make sure the time settings are set up and then on the IBM I, we're gonna set up the network time protocol. This is a protocol that, you know, it's, it's generally in use in a lot of uh, servers, not on IBM I, but you, you would really be shocked at how bad the actual time is on most IBM eyes that I encounter. Like if you look at the time setting, a lot of them are not really very accurate, like they're off by some minutes or, or worse. So setting up the network time protocol is one of the things we're gonna do. You also have to be on Valence uh, this version or later. This is actually the latest version as of now. So if you're watching this on a, you know, on a, on a recording later, then uh, make sure you're on this version or higher. Uh, you also have to turn on Valence beta features. So in Valence 5.2, this feature is considered a beta feature and I'll show you how to do that. Uh, but if you're watching this later on and you're on Valence 6 or higher, this is not a beta feature there. This would be sort of a standard feature. So you would not have to turn on beta features. Uh, then we'll review and set the Valence two-factor authentication settings, especially whether you want the two-factor authentication to be optional for a user or mandatory, okay? Um, and then you really have to tell your users about the two-factor authentication, right? You can't just turn this on and then the user, you know, sees these two-factor authentication screens coming up and they have no idea, you know, what to do with it. So you have to tell your users about it. All right, so, so let's just go ahead and get started. The first thing we'll do is I'll show you how to review the date and time settings and set up the network time protocol on IBM I. All right, here we go. So I'm gonna flip over to my browser and I'm just on a test system here. Go ahead and log in. <clears throat> uh, now I'm gonna use the green screen. So I'm gonna use this Fusion 5250 built into uh, the latest version of Valence. If you haven't used this, check it out. It's just the most convenient way for me to get in there. So we're gonna look at the date and time settings. So work sys val T T I M. And the first thing I wanna check is the time zone. <clears throat> 
So a lot of uh, new systems are installed, but the time zone is never checked. So you just sort of set the time, you know, make sure the time is accurate, but no one checks the time zone. So make sure your time zone is correct. We're in central daylight time right now on this system, and that is correct. So first thing, check your time zone. Then <clears throat> what I normally do is I'll, I'll look at the system date and time, and it looks like I'm looking at the time here on my Mac is 10.07, and that's 10.07. But actually what I'll do here but it has to really be within the second, right? Like if it's 10 seconds off and your, uh, the code that's valid changes every 30 seconds and, you, and your times are 10 seconds off, then your users are gonna have uh, some time where their code that they're trying to enter is not valid. So let's see, if I do this, I can see, you can see my analog clock over here. <clears throat> and let's refresh this. So this is, says second is 04. So the time actually on this system right now is off by something like 10 to 15 seconds is off. So that would be a big problem. If I turned on two-factor authentication right now, it would be a huge problem. So let's go set up the um, network time protocol and that's built into the operating system. So if you just do go TCP ADM and number two to configure TCP IP applications, and I'm gonna page down because the network time protocol is not on this list, it's on the second page, so it's number 19. It's change SNTP attributes, so 19. Now, you have to pick a server on the internet that your IBM I can communicate with to get the current accurate time. So a prerequisite to this is obviously that your IBM I has access to the internet. Most systems do, but if you don't have uh, access to the internet through the IBM I. Maybe your network has another time server that's internal to the network. Some networks are set up like that. So you could use that IP address or system name here as, as your time server. So whatever, check and see whatever your other servers are using for a time server and, and you can use that one. Uh, I like this one. This is like a most common one. Uh, it's like US pool. This is a sort of, uh, one that a lot of systems are hooked to. And then what I'm gonna do is copy this. So you can enter more than one. Paste that. So there's like these three. So it'll, tr it'll try the first one. And if this one's not available, it'll try that one. And if that one's not available, it'll try this one. Okay, so those are the time server we're going to use. And then auto start, we're, this is like, okay, if I'm restarting the IBM I and it's going to start, is this service going to start automatically? Yes, okay. And then um, this can automatically generate an activity log uh, out on the IFS. It will create a document just to let you know what it's doing. And so I like to set this value to change so that anytime it is actually changing the time, then it's gonna make a log and I can go back and look at that, okay? All right, so now when I press enter, it's also, I'm just gonna go back in there and make sure that it's all still there. Yep, looks good. And then I'm gonna do start TCP SVR, prompt it, and the service type that I'm gonna start is NTP. And uh, I should explain also that the NTP service on IBM I, <clears throat> there's a client service and a server service. So you can actually set up IBM I to be a time server that other servers will synchronize off of. Um, we're not, I'm not using that. I mean, you can set that up if you want, but right, right now I'm just worried. I, I just want to set up the client service so that it goes out to an internet service to get the current time. So it's the client service that we're starting and that is the default. Okay. So when I press enter, now the time service has started and I was what, about 15 seconds off. Now you would think that what it's gonna do, it's gonna go out and get the current time and then immediately adjust the time by 15 seconds. No, that is actually not what happens. It gets the current time and then what, what the IBM I uh, NTP service will do is it'll like speed up the clock or slow it down to over some number of minutes, bring the time closer uh, to what the uh, what has been responded to by the service and that will help uh, you know some systems have software that is very time sensitive getting time stamps and everything so you wouldn't want to have a really big time jump but since I was only off by 10 or 15 seconds it might already be um, getting pretty close now at this point so let's go back here 
and I'll show the time again and we'll see how far off we are now. So I'm going to press enter when I see my analog clock hit 30 seconds. Okay, and it's at 25. So it's all it's still off by five seconds, but it's already corrected it by say five or 10 seconds. So if I wait just a little bit longer, we'll see it closing in on the accurate time. Um, and I'll, I'll just wait till it gets to the top of the hour. Um, so the next thing we'll do after that, after we confirm that the time is completely accurate, then we'll go into balance and set up the two-factor authentication. I'll show you how that's done. Okay, so now let's see. So it's only about two seconds off now. I think that's probably close enough to continue. By the time I uh, start getting into valence and looking at some other screens, it should be super accurate. Okay, so that's that. And I'm just gonna go ahead and close this and sign off and make the screen bigger. All right. Um, all right, so let's go into portal administration. <clears throat> and settings. So the first thing uh, we have to do is make sure we have beta features turned on. So if you just go up here and you type in the word beta, it'll bring you down to that area. So beta features are not currently enabled. So I'll just check this box and save it. <clears throat> and what that's gonna do is gonna make a bunch of other options available. Now, if I go here and I search for 2FA, two-factor authentication, it'll bring me to this section where these are my two-factor authentication settings, okay? Um, I'll just go over these really quick. So mandatory for all users is, is obviously, you don't wanna turn that on right away, right? You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you personally do some testing with this uh, to make sure that it's working correctly before you click this box to say mandatory for all users. Um, because if you click that, next time the user logs in, it's gonna force them to set up the two-factor authentication with their phone, all right? They won't be able to continue without setting that up. So the rest of this uh, uh, demonstration I'm gonna to do today is just gonna be the optional method, but just know that you can come back and turn that on and it'll force the users to use it. Um, the step duration of 30, that's the number of, sec number of seconds before the code changes. Um, this is very, you can change it to 15 or 45 seconds, whatever you want. I personally have never used a system or seen a system that didn't use 30 seconds. That seems to be the sort of industry standard. Um, maximum attempts to enter that code correctly is going to be three times. After three times, then it's going to deactivate the user's profile. So if that becomes a problem, you can increase that to five times or whatever you need. Also, the system is going to give you, when you set up the two-factor authentication for, for an individual user, there's going to be something called recovery codes. And these are eight-digit codes. Um, that the user can sort of print off and store somewhere in case they lose their phone or something goes wrong, they can use these one-time use codes um, to, get, to get in without their phone. If you don't wanna use that feature, uh, you can put this to zero or you can get, change it to two codes or whatever, so that's what that setting is for. So that's really all we need to do here. I'll just go ahead and save. And I will log off. And when I log back in, I'll show you, we now have the ability to set up the two-factor authentication. So as a user, my user settings are here. If I click that menu and I click the circle with my initial there, if you look over here, uh, you won't see this unless you turn on the beta feature. So if you're going into this and you don't see this, it's one of two problems. You either are not on the latest version of Valence or the, the version that I mentioned that you have to be on or later, or you haven't turned on the beta features if you don't see this, okay? So now if when I click this, what it's giving me is a, a two-dimensional barcode that I'm gonna use with the app on my phone to set this up. So all the information, uh, the system has generated like a really complex secret key for me uh, that's encrypted and given some other information that's all embedded in this two-dimensional barcode, which is gonna be read by the, the app on my phone. So now at this point, I want you to see what I'm doing on my phone. So I'm gonna to try to stop my Mac screen sharing and do screen sharing from my phone. I've only done this a couple of times, but uh, it has worked both times and we're gonna hope that it works again. So here we go, I'm gonna stop my screen share. And I'm gonna to try to share with my phone. This will just take a few moments.
Okay. Johnny, can you confirm for me that you see my phone? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. All right. So I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to like move it out of the way from all right. So now on my phone, <clears throat> I've already installed this app called Google Authenticator. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through that process. So I'm on an iPhone. So uh, you know, I've just went to the app store and I searched for Google Authenticator. You can use Microsoft Authenticator. I was working with a customer the other day, said they're all Microsoft, they do everything Microsoft. And I'm like, that's fine. Just install Microsoft Authenticator. It works the same way. Um, so I just installed the Google Authenticator and I just launched it. So at the very bottom of the screen there, you see the begin setup. So I'm touching begin setup. And what it's going to do is going to activate the camera. Oh, I got to click scan barcode. Okay. With the valence setup, you have to click scan barcode. You can't do it as a manual entry because we're not, we don't want to reveal the secret codes to anyone. So we're doing all by the barcode. So I'm going to touch scan barcode. And then you're actually going to see what I'm doing here. I'm bringing my phone towards my screen and I'm just, once it hits the barcode, now it has done it sort of done the handshake with valence and giving me this code. And you can see the little Pac-Man thing uh, to the lower right of where the number is and it's sort of counting down. That's sort of like the 30 second clock countdown. And then when that counts down to nothing, you'll see the code will change, all right? And it's going red there for a second, letting you know, you know you're getting to the point where it's gonna change. So if you see it red, you might wanna just wait a few seconds before trying to type in the code to give you time. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come come back to, I'm gonna stop the screen sharing. Or I'm gonna stop my phone sharing, go back to screen sharing. Okay, Johnny, can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. So now the current code that I'm looking at on my phone, which you can't see now, because we can only see one at a time, is, and I'm just gonna type it in at six, oops. Got to get focus here again. It's six zero four nine zero four. Okay, and because I had it configured that I wanted the user to have recovery codes, it's giving me eight recovery codes. Okay, and I could print this out, put it in a drawer, put it in my backpack, or something like that. Again, if you set that to zero, it won't give them recovery codes at all. Um, but yeah, I'll just show you what this is. If I click print, you know, it's going to give you a, sort of a nice sheet that the user can store. Okay. Um, but I can just close this when I'm done. And now, now uh, this would change to disable two-step authentication. So now it's, it's set up. So I'm going to click OK and log out. Okay. So now anytime I log in, you just do the same thing you always did. Put in your regular password. Click log in. And because I have two-factor authentication set up, now I have to open the Google Authenticator app and type in the current code. And that's it. That's how it works. Nice. And again, the, the most important setting there in Portal Admin uh, is, is the mandatory. So if you say mandatory, then what would happen for every user the next time they came through and log in, it would take them through the setup process automatically. They would not have to go into the user settings where they have to click their initial, the, the circle with the initial in it and everything. It'll just do it right from the login screen and force them to set it up. Okay. All right. So uh, I guess I'll take questions on this topic uh, before we move on to the next topic and I pass it back to Johnny. So is there any questions from anyone? see anybody Not nothing in the chat johnny no not nothing in the chat right now okay all right well it's pretty straightforward right i mean it's, it's pretty straightforward to set it up um if anybody has any difficulties with setting it up or whatever since this is a beta feature and it's brand new there's actually not a documentation page for this yet so this video really that you know we'll make this uh developer diaries a video available to watch it's really the only uh, documentation we have on it at the moment. And we will have a full documentation page with Valence 6 coming out, uh, which probably should be out in June, Valence 6, but not guaranteed. But that's our plan is to push Valence 6 out in June. All right, Johnny, I will pass it back to you then. All right. Thanks, Richard. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to 
do a bit of diving into the Nitro App Builder Grid widget. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Let me just find my. Okay. All right, Sean, can you see my screen? Uh, no, I just see your video. My video. Stop share. I'll try it again. Uh, how about now? Yep. Okay, sweet. All right, like we said, we're gonna do a bit of diving into the grid widget, which we can, we don't have proof of this, but Sean, I guess, I don't think you'd argue this point that it's probably the most popular or most used widget <laughs> out of all the widgets. Sure. Um, so before this, we've already created a data source that we're just gonna, you know, uh, work off of. This data source is a, um, it's an SQL data source based off some order information, and we're just gonna jump into the grid. <clears throat> All right, so some of this might seem somewhat basic, but we're gonna go into other more advanced, I guess, or features of it. Um, so you're presented with your columns, which is your columns off of your record, you know, from your data source itself. And here's where you want to present which, which fields do you want to display to the user. Um, I'm going to just select all for right now just to get something going. And, you know, we always show at the bottom at least the headers of the grid. This will help if you start changing And especially will help when you start adjusting the width and the flex of columns. Um, I guess, should we talk about markup in the column heading since I just changed the column heading? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, and anywhere where you can type in text, typically, you know, whether, whether it be a title or a label, you can put your own HTML markup in there. Right. So I not always encouraged though, but. In this case, that's perfect. So as you can see, I just did break to a new line. And now that column heading is actually breaking. So you can put your own markup in the label itself for that column, as Sean said. Alignment, I think, is pretty straightforward. Left, center, right. Sortable if you want the user to be able to sort on those columns. We default it all the time, but there might be reasons that you might not want to sort by that column. Yeah, we've, we've definitely had customers where, you know, they because exactly. the default is sortable and they may have a, a file that just, or, or a statement that the indexes are just don't lend themselves well to sorting on that column. <laughs> so, you know, and it, and it takes, minutes to come back. So I guess don't always assume that sortable true is always the best thing. Okay. And then we can easily just flip between if you want to just see it. Here's the configure tab and then back to the columns. You can also see it here, but sometimes it's better to get a full view of it. Um, lock. I rarely use this. <laughs> I don't know, Sean, do you use it often? I don't, um, uh, yeah, be honest, I don't think I've, yeah, I've, I've, I've never used it. So this is... We know it works, but I've never used it in my development. Right. <laughs> so this will lock the column itself. Let me go back here. We need a little bit more width on that one, but which one did I lock? Let's do this. Uh, two. Okay, so this, well, I guess I need to change it to have some columns to make it worthwhile, right? Um, all these can't be flex, because that's all, the reason for the lock is really, I wanna be able to keep this column always here, 
And then I might have horizontal scrolling of these columns to the right of it. And that's probably why we've never really used lock often. Right, because we often try to stay away from horizontal scrolling in the grid. Um, Sean's right, that's probably why we don't use it. But if we changed all of these widths to not be flex anymore and they're fixed widths, um, so I'm just gonna, this is not gonna look nice, but just to give you an idea. So now you can see we have horizontal scrolling. However, this is fixed, so it's locked. That column is locked. So you can have multiple locked columns, um, and it's just another option that's built into the, to the grid widget itself. Um, hidden is kind of an interesting one. Like, why would I ever set something to hidden? Good point. While I'm doing this, do you want to talk about why, why would you? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Um, Hidden, hidden, setting a column to hidden would just mean that the user would have access to it um, to make it visible. So, so if, if, if Johnny would, would select hidden on one of those columns, let's say order number. Um, so now it's available and they can, there you go, drop that down and, oh, I think we need to allow, um, what are we missing here, hide columns. Yes, we need to check hide columns. Wait, where's Ryman? Oh, there it is. Hide column header? No. No, hide columns. Oh, duh. There we go. So now you'll have the ability to choose which columns and then order number should be in there. Okay. So we give them the ability to say, like if they wanted more columns, but we really don't want to initially set this grid list up with that column to be shown for everyone and then the user can set that up and then I guess you can state if I'm wrong, but if I decide to show that column, next time I come in, I'll see that column, right? We're storing state for that for the user itself. So right. one user can see it one and one might not because they didn't turn it back on. All right. Well I guess this is, we're kind of going from left to right. Um, formatting. So this is where we have our canned formatters. So if you're dealing with dates, um, this is what you see. This is what your value is of your column. And this is what you'll get. So the formatted value. So I have a, an ISO date and I want it, you know, month, day, year. And they're just all different formatted values. And there's dates, there's for numbers, miscellaneous. Something. Okay, so for like almost a true or false. So if it's a Y, a true, a one, or an on, you'll get a check mark. Um, phone number, money, and then what else we have? And just number itself. And then this before and after is, if you wanted to be able to add text or something before and after the value. So before the value, I wanted to say uh, CMX. Which one did I just do it on? Okay, so order number. And it's still hidden, I gotta turn it back on. So you can see now there's CMX in front of the value. Um, I guess this would be useful for what? Like a unit of measure or something on a value? You know? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I guess I, I, yeah, it's hard to think of a. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember the, the initial re, like when it was added, that feature request. I can't remember what the use case was, but it's there. I'm going to take that off. And you can do after too. So whatever you put there would be after the value of your, of the column or field itself. Okay, formatting, custom formatting. So this is, bringing you into an area that you can, you can put in your own JavaScript. Um, you're wrapped in what we say is a function. So you're wrapped in a function and you get past some values. You get past the value of that cell, right? 
you get past the full record, so that's the whole row of data. And then any, any filters that are set up on this uh, widget itself, uh, the column and the grid. But I think really these, this is, this is the most important, right? I mean, this is the mostly used, right, Sean? Yeah. Yeah, so typically, so, so if, if you were to do a, a render of return V, it's, we're just gonna get the exact same thing that, right. we're all, that we already see, because that's what the base grid does for each cell, it just returns the value. And we see the same thing, the same so, exact value for order number. So if you were to do like return V plus ABC, so we're just trying to drive home the point that V is the value right. that it designated for that cell already. And you can return, you don't have to just return just like plain text per se, we can return markup, right? Yep. So I guess right here, let's, uh, I already have a renderer just set up. I'm just gonna copy and paste it, but. So we're using one of our, we're checking if the value is empty. And this is, you can see this in like in our API, API guides. Um, I mean, you could have just done this too, I guess. I just am so used to doing this. You could have said if V. So if, the val if it has a value, I want to return markup and I'm actually returning a, a link, okay, a hyperlink. And then this is just regular old HTML. And you can see we're using, in this scenario, we're using that record, that second parameter that's passed us and that's the full row. And I know that my column of item is what I want to get and that's the name of it. And you can see item. So I'm just going and getting the value of item and returning this string, which will, because it's a string and it's returning its markup, will be on the page and displayed as a link. So if we hit okay. Now you see that these are links. So if I click on this, it's opening up a new window and showing an image from, our, from the IFS. Okay, summary. Or should we stick with, should I do the image and an icon font since we were just in the renderer? Yeah, because that's, that's probably pretty typical that I, I might want to display an image in a cell and then I might I want to image. use one of our icons to display in a cell. All right, so I already have the markup for image. So image is gonna be close, somewhat the same. We're going and getting that image file off our IFS based off the item. So again, we're, we're getting the item, it's not empty. We're returning markup, which is just an image tag. And this should render it so we can see the image in line. And again, we're using the rec, second parameter record. We're, we're not even using V, which is value, unless it's empty and then we'll hit this return. So we're expecting to see images in this image column. And there we go. So I switched to configure. So now we've injected images into our grid. The other thing as Sean was saying, we could do it by icon. Like we have our own icons built in. So before I go there, let's go to admin. And here are all the icons that are available to us. And these are the icons you can stamp on your app record that's displayed in the launch pad for the user. And you can also use them in nav. And to use them, you just need to hover and find out what's that icon's name, ID. And just hovering over will show you VV icon dash something. So I'm going to add an icon to the make or buy, which I've already set up to. Uh, 
okay, this is just checking that's not empty. Then we're just saying, hey, if, if V, because I'm in make, is, if V is equal to M, then make is true, otherwise it's false. And the reason we did that was just because based on if it's a make or a buy, we wanna set a specific icon and a specific color. So here we're saying, okay, if it's make, then we're gonna use this VB icon hammer wrench. Otherwise, it's not make, that means it's buy, we'll use coins. And then color wise, we're just setting this variable of color. If it's make, we're using this color, otherwise we're using this color. And then we're returning back the markup. So we have just a div, a little styling to make sure that the, the size of that font is, is a size we want. We're adding our color. And then here we're putting our icon. And not to make this a, a JavaScript right. lesson or anything, but just so everyone knows, like line three, that would be the same thing as if make icon equals, you know, BB icon hammer wrench else BB icon or yeah, icon equals BB icon coins. It's just a, a syntax in JavaScript that you can shorthand that John's using there, basically. So what he was, what Sean's saying is then it would be icon equal otherwise icon equal to, you know, whatever. So it's just a little shorthand. Anything else you think we should point out on this or am I missing anything? I can't think of anything. Okay. All right, and now we see, I'm just gonna move over here. So now we see those icons. We definitely would want to adjust our, you know, so type probably Maybe center. Yeah, just center. I'll just do that. So now we can see those icons and they have the color. If we didn't have color on there, they would just be, I think the, the, the base is just like a gray, right? Right, Sean? Yeah. So it doesn't have to have color. You don't have to have the color either. <clears throat> okay. I think that's good for renderers, unless anybody has any questions on that. I mean, really, the point is any any valid HTML markup is valid to be returned within a grid cell. Right. Yes, that's true. All right. Summary. Um, I just saw something come in from the chat. Can you also change the background color of a cell? Well, you could do it through the renderer or you can do it through colors. Exactly. Um, you know, so it, it really, you know, ideally you'd want to do it through the colors. Yeah. Option. If you couldn't, then sure, you could just return a div that has a background color of any color that you wanted. Right. And we're going to get into the colors part so we can show that. But you can do that within the renderer. Um, ooh, sure. I don't know how I just lost my screen. You can do that within the renderer or you could do it in colors. I personally would just do it in colors, but unless I'm having to do other things, I guess. So let's say we just wanted a default color to, you know, without any rules. Sure. We can just go right in and say, this column background color is always um, blue. I did it on the order number. And there's the, the color adjusted. So yeah, like Sean said, we didn't do any rules. So this is just saying we want the background color always to be this, or we could have done the text always to be a specific color. We'll get back to colors in a second. Hopefully that answered the question. All right, summary. So this, I wish I can keep this chat open. Um, 
So this gives us a way to summarize the data itself for that specific column, right? So we could do a total, let's just do a count. I'm gonna go to configure because it should show better. And we get our summary information on the bottom. So however you wanna summarize that data, could be if I have what? Uh, money, I want to see the total. Um, oops. Or trying to think of really good use case. Uh, the average I could see using a lot. Total or count. Oh, do you have any points on this one, Sean? No. Okay. Let me just uncheck this. Sure, I'll just leave it. Okay, colors. All right, we were kind of in this a second ago. So this is a way for you to do a blanket background color for a specific uh, column or text color for a specific column, but also we can do rules. And I think I might switch to a different, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna switch to uh, product class. It'll be easier. Okay. So, with rules, you can say, hey, if, if you might wanna test the actual cells value or also other field values in your, in your record or row and determine a color. So we're gonna add a rule. And I'm just gonna say that for product class, I'm gonna use product class. And if it's equal to hardware, I want to set it to a sure a background of a brown. And that's all I want. So I should see hardware. And I think that there's other cells. Okay, so you can see that the rule came into play. It checks and says, yep, it's hardware. We'll we'll set that color. Otherwise, it's not hardware, it's not doing anything. So you could have, and we could have many rules. I could, I, you could say, okay, if it's hardware, have it this color. I want to add another rule and say, if it's not hardware, but it's uh, PL, PCB. So I'll do the same thing. PCB. I'm going to make it red background. Also, I like to bring up that you can let me let this render. This column section, this is setting it to say, I want this, if this field is equal to this column value. So it's not hard coded. I'm not hard coding a value. I'm not doing a static value of PCB. I could be testing my product class, which I clicked over here, testing it against with any of these operators against a specific other column in my record and determine if we want to make a color change either by background or the text of it. And I'm gonna do text on that one. I'll do static update. So this one we're saying, if it's PCB, we want it red, and I'm just gonna do text this time, just show the difference. So we're not doing background. And you can see we kind of try to show you that here. And there, PCB, so, all right. Well, I think we should get into the configure a bit. Unless there's any questions. Some of these are straightforward. If you want users to be able to resize columns, um, move columns around, I'm gonna do the multi-sort, I'm, I'm not gonna do the high column. Button. So now that I <clears throat> set those, we can move those things around. And as we stated earlier that by user, if I move it around and I come back, we save state. I like to pin, uh, point out though, if we come in and change this widget, let's say two weeks later, um, come in, make a change, hit save. The next time the user goes to it, even if they move stuff around, since the widget was changed, they're gonna lose those, you know, let's say I moved item code to uh, after default price, but then I, as a um, developer, I came in and made mods to this widget, it's gonna revert back to its original state and they'd have to change it back if they wanted to. 
that's just because we need to be able to get the latest for them. And then again, we can show in high columns as a user. The multi-column sorting, which we turned on, will automatically give us this sort bar. So I could, in essence, do this type of sorting. I've got two columns that I'm sorting by and I could switch it here. If I clicked it, it's descending. I could actually move it and say, now I want my sort order to be order quantity, order number, or I can just remove the sort. <clears throat> Um, UI. So we defaulted to modern, but slim view is just, you're not going to see it here, are we, Sean? Well, it's because of your, yeah. uh, it's because, because of your images, images and everything. Yeah. They're, just they're slim view just stuff. makes the rows a little thinner. There's less uh, padding, but since we have images and it's making the row already big, we're not, we're not really seeing a difference between that. But if we didn't have those images, you'd see it. You'd see slight difference between modern and uh, slim. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Paging. Uh, you wanna page the results, you have a lot of data. Uh, usually, by default, if we turn it off paging, we are gonna see that it's limited. It's limited to, uh, what is I can't remember, 5,000? Yeah. Okay. So, yep, paging. Infinite scroll is, instead of having this paging toolbar and you have to page through it, you can just choose infinite scroll. And really, then, in, infinite scroll is paging. It just doesn't right. show the paging toolbar. Right. Exactly. But it's doing the paging in the background as the user's scrolling. It's calculating the number of rows that we currently have and the speed of the scroll and it'll go out and get the next data sets, next set, next set of records, sorry. And I think as far as a rule of thumb with paging, if, if, if you have, a, you know, typically at least what I do, if I, if I have a couple thousand records at most, I, I typically don't page. Right. Searching, uh, think of it like a global search. By default, you can say active. Defaults it starts with, so that means anything you're searching for, the user searching for, it must start with uh, this value. So I could say HEX. So I'm gonna just get records that have HEX in it. And it's going across the whole, all the columns in that row. Um, I could say contains. I usually always do contains. Um, that way it's like whatever I'm searching for, it it's, starts with, ends with, or within that value, I'll get it. So I could say, uh, 3-8, and we're getting anything that has 3-8 in it. You could switch it to exact, and that means they have to put the whole value in, so I have to type in hex nut 375 to get that row to show to filter down by it. This text is just if you want to override the, the empty value of the search field, you could call it, uh, uh, go. I mean, whatever. I don't see people really change that often, but, and then again, you can do it by column. This is, if you don't want to do it, just a global search. You want the user to be able to come up and say, I want to search this column by anything less than, and it'll know that this column is actually a number. Uh, this one's a date. So we should see a date picker. So on or before this date. So this gives more of a granular, uh, uh, way to search. I can search by this column and then this column is a little more detail. So I don't know how many people use that one. Data. Auto load. This means when the widget's going to be presented to the user, should we automatically load the data? Uh, sometimes you might want, want might not want to do that. Um, the way your app is built, you might want to wait until you go and filter this widget. So don't auto load. Allow copying of row data. This is just giving the user the ability to say like, until it renders. I can come here and start dragging and, and then whatever's highlighted, you can see it's highlighted. I can do a control C and copy it in my clipboard and paste it somewhere else. Grouping, this one's used. So any column that's available to this widget, we can group by. 
don't know if it's going to work or not. I think because there's so many, there's so many uh, what different mean? order numbers, probably. Oh. Uh, Maybe group by. Uh, I think I just froze this. Item. Thing. Let me go back in that. Just lost it. I think I might have lost my communication in the back end, actually. Hold on. This is, the VPN, I think, just popped off. Okay. Yeah, restarting the VPN did it. Um, let me just get back. So we were at group by, so I don't know, item. Yeah. Come on, okay. I think it was just a problem with the VPN connection. So you can choose that group, the direction, ascending or descending. By default, defaults ascending. Auto refresh if you want this widget. And this is across the board, all widgets have this. It'll just automatically reload the data. So it's, it's in seconds, so I could say 30 seconds, 90 seconds. One thing to point out too, it probably really doesn't make sense to do a group by if you're paging. That's very true, yes, right. And then download. This one we have, so we can, we can automatically say download at Excel and uh, the name of the file, let's just say order. The sheet name within that file, so orders. And we'll do PDF too. Same with PDF, you get some more options than Excel, the file name, order. Uh, if you want a header on that PDF, uh, my header. And then you can change font size, you can put footer text. Um, the orientation. And the page break on group, this is like, do you want to break on the group itself when you're downloading a PDF? So the, the PDF download definitely has more flexibility in terms of options. Um, yeah. And one thing to point out too is the, there's the Excel and then there's the legacy Excel. Um, the Excel is a front end, it create, right Johnny, it creates the spreadsheet via the front end, which will honor colors, um, renderers, right? Yes. Whereas legacy Excel is really, that's a back end um, creation where you're not, it's not gonna have the coloring, it's not gonna have the renderers. That's correct, yeah. Um, this is a new, it's a new, op, new, fee, new option, new feature, probably about a few months ago that we added because we just want to be able to give all those, all the renders and everything to adhere to when they download the Excel. So when you're selecting that, I think we kept the legacy Excel because if you have million, like I would say 100,000 or 200,000 rows of data that you want to download, you're going to want to use the legacy Excel and not use the default or normal Excel because that's going to take a lot more time to build. So it's better to be built on the back end and then served to the front end. So then you get those two options. Since we have a paging bar, you get the download and then you get the PDF because we turn those on. Filters, I, I, this isn't really specific to grid widgets. So I really don't think we should go yeah. over it too detailed. It's just every widget has filters and I think we might dive into those in another session. And same with post. Yeah. So I think that's, that's good. That's all of it. Went through all the items, unless there's any questions. I mean, a lot of people already use it, so. I'm not sure. If... Yeah, I think that's all I got. Unless you have anything else you want to just. No. Chat. We've got a few minutes left. I don't see anything in the chat. Okay. So... All right. Okay, well, that ends our fifth valence developer diary session and uh we'll be back next friday and uh we will post on our um calendar uh which you can find at the main website under calendar we'll be posting the session information um and also we'll have this re 
this is being recorded and we'll upload it to our YouTube channel um, by end of day today, probably. All right. Well, thanks everybody. And uh, oh, there's a chat. Is there any? Oh, awesome. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Theory. All right, everybody. Well, you guys all have a good weekend. Um, and we'll see you next Friday. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.